complications. They stay in the hospital for 10 days, the fractures, I mean, they stay for 10 days. We had, uh, I think, three or four deaths out of 40 cases. So the 10% mortality in fractures with a COVID negative. With COVID negative? Yeah. So and a false and 10%, negative? 10% uh, pulmonary embolism rate in these patients. Most of them very fragile patients because we used to operate like three total hips and two hemiprosthesis per week uh, during, um, due to fractures. And now we operated like 30 hemiprosthesis because of frailty or fragility mm -hmm. and, and, and 10 total hips. So the, the equation of, of the, the kind of patients that are arriving to our hospital is completely different. Yeah, yeah. So Hello, do you Martin. think some of, the, some of those patients were false negatives, that they actually did have COVID? Because the test is not so accurate, I don't think. Well, PCR is quite exactly. And, and after this, the patients didn't start with any symptoms. So they were still COVID negative, but we don't really know what was, why was this high rate of, of complications? We're going to, we're gathering all these cases with the, the trauma unit who, who operates the transtrochanteric fractures and they, they observe the same, the same situation. High rate of complications, a lot of hospital stay, high rate of pulmonary embolism and a, and a triple, triple or five-fold um, rate of death that's very very impressing yeah yeah very bad i see graham so, is hi graham hi, hi graham hello. hello martin hi there hi how hi okay how are you well thank you and yourself great thanks thanks a lot for coming not at all not at all you look healthy as usual it's a pleasure. Now I feel I feel very healthy. Thank you very much. Yes, just just getting older and more wrinkly. Still playing tennis? No, no, I can't run no. around anymore. Golf, golf and skiing is. Uh, I can still do golf and skiing. So that's great. That's great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, this is a relaxed atmosphere, as I tried to explain to you in the emails. We are the uh, ex fellows of Rodolfo Puso and Frank Picaluga uh, gathering here, as well as the residents and the team. Uh, I started the, the chief of the unit in March. Uh, Frank is, also, is still working, um, but uh, he resigned the, the, the chief uh, unit. Uh, so I started on March, and we started this, open, this HIP webinars uh, like 10 weeks ago. So it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, it's one minute to start, and I don't know if you want to speak about something, just feel relaxed. Uh, there will be like 30 or 50 people here, so it, we are all hip specialists and some residents, and, and it's a great pleasure to have you. I'm very relaxed, thanks, Martin. This looks like coffee, but actually I've got my whiskey in here, so you... Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, I, I'm doing the same with the mate. <laughs> no, it's very kind of you to invite us. In fact, I have a very soft spot uh, for Argentina, as you know, since I met my wife there 15 or 16 yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know, I know. And you came a lot of times, and you, you are always kind to us, coming and, and, and learning a lot from you as I was about to show. So now being on time, I would like to share my screen and present to you. Can you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, Thanks again for being with us. We have the uh, stellar presence of two friends and, and I would like to 
call them mentors because I will work with them not too many times, but I learned a lot. The first one is Professor John Timperley, who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon. And also the first one is Graham Gee, who is an honorary consultant orthopedic surgeon, both at Princess Elizabeth Orthopedic Center in Exeter, UK. Professor Timperley is Robin Link's disciple. He is now the leader of the Exeter group. He was the president of the British Hip Society. He's a, an, an executive of the British Orthopedic Association. He has a PhD degree at the University of Oxford and is an honorary chair professor at the College of Engineer and Mathematics and Physical Sciences at the University of Exeter. He's a member like uh, Frank and myself of the International Hip Society and he has more than 60 publications and many book chapters. And Mr. Graham Gee was a hip fellowship in Exeter with Professor Ling in 1985. He got the John Charlie Research Fellowship and he spent some time at the University Hospital in Nijmegen, Netherlands, where Tom Sloof uh, used to work. He and Professor Ling invented the femoral impaction grafting technique. He is a member of the International Hip Society. He was also the president of the British Hip Society, and he also wrote more than 60 publications and many book chapters. I had the lucky of spending less than two months with this unbelievable team. And, and, and at that time, Professor Ling was coming to the, to, the, to the meetings, to the weekly meetings, so it was a great pleasure. And before we start with the conferences, I would like to show the guest lecturers some uh, similitudes between our hospitals, our units, and theirs. First of all, I would like to show you that our service, the orthopedic service, was founded um, at the same year in 1926, or more or less one year, as the Princess Elizabeth Orthopedic Center. We started with four beds, in 1926, um, the head was Dr. Biles, and you started one year later, or the same year, because maybe it was less than one year. Also, our units have some common points. Professor Loving, Robin Ling and Raham developed the impaction grafting technique, as I previously told you, and the first impaction grafting surgery was in May 1987. And Rodolfo Puso, who was the chief of our unit, did the same method without knowing each other three months later. And we published our first results the, the same year that the uh, inventors of the technique published it in the BJJ or the JBJS British in 1991. I would also like to show you at least 10 changes in our unit that were learned from Exeter on the, the two months that I spent there and also later. The first one was we changed that uh, the head, the femoral head from 22 to 28, and our dislocation rate was reduced from 11% using the posterior appro approach to 2%. So we presented this in 2003. I brought the idea to our unit that uh, the support or the positioner should have two points in both ASIS and what that was very useful to position correctly our caps, our acetabulums. I also saw this technique for optimization of the cementation technique for the cap, so our caps look really great after learning this uh, Simple tip. I learned how to, how to use metal meshes, and it was extremely useful for our patients during the revision surgery. We also learned how to combine the meshes with impaction grafting and struts in order to reconstruct very, very difficult cases and have great long term results. We also learned how to use long stems in order to prevent periprosthetic fractures and in extremely severe defects in the elbow. 
the link. We learned the scalp sign of Mr. Graham Gee, and we used the cement within cement technique that was really a, a mystery before I was in Exeter. And we dare to combine the cement within cement technique with proximal impaction grafting reconstruction that I think that is a method that is not well known combining these two methods, but also who gave us great uh, results in complex cases. Number nine is that we use Exeter stems to solve problems that uh, were caused by stems not designed for impaction grafting technique. And number 10, this is a recent observation, uh, although the technique has more than 10 years, we learn how to do the split osteotomy in order to remove a fixed and cemented stem in revision surgery, avoiding ETO and with a simple circular cable. So I have to thank you boys because your support to our unit was really great. Thank you very much. You can start, please. Thank you, Martin. And I think I'm gonna go first. So can I share my screen now? Okay, can you see the screen on? Yeah, that's perfect, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your introduction. Sorry, we have... no, I haven't got your screen, Yours, um, for some, some reason. Um, I've still got Martin's screen. Oh. Um, why is that? I, I stopped sharing, so... No, because John is using my slide. <laughs> that's the reason. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, no, can I've got see? it now. Yes, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, it's gone back. To, it's gone back to you. Oh, all right. We'll, we'll no, no. That's. But I put. I used the same slide. It was so beautifully put together, Martin. So I used. Oh, it. Okay. So just uh, to, for our presentations, I'm going to go first um, to talk about tissue sparing approaches to the hip, and then uh, Graham is going to go talk about impaction grafting. I think in the femur and in the acetabulum, aren't you, Graham? Uh, and yeah. very appropriate yeah. since we have such a long history together. Uh, with Martin and ourselves, and Martin has published so widely on this that we should have some interesting discussions uh, afterwards. Uh, but really, I'd like to talk about something new we're doing and uh, where I think there will be advances in the future of hip arthroplasty. I think the days of having a lot of new implants have gone, and there will be other things that will take our interest to try and improve the results for patients. And one of these is sparing more of the soft tissues around the hip. And I'll talk about the anterior, not so much about the direct superior. I'll talk about the transgluteal merely to um, dismiss it really, uh, because I think we're going to find that the direct lateral approach will disappear in the next five or 10 years. And I think there will be very few excuses for doing that approach. And then I'll talk about the posterior approach and the tissue sparing approaches. Martin, it's informal, so perhaps I can ask you, in your country and in your unit, um, how many people do the posterior, how many direct lateral, what approaches, and in Argentina, generally? Most, most of, of the surgeons use the posterior lateral approach. Some of them use the anterolateral approach that was described by another British surgeon who was Hardinch. Mm -hmm. And some of them, but very few, are starting with direct anterior approach. There is a surgeon called Paulus Ruditer who works with us spent one year in Canada and he's starting in our unit to do select cases of direct anterior approach but most of us use postural Gibson approach. Right I mean I think I was pred to predict the future in terms of approaches I think that the direct lateral approach will disappear as I was saying in the next five or ten years and those who are used to that approach and used to that view will gradually go forwards to the uh, direct anterior approach especially as more surgeons are trained in it. And I th hope and think that those who are used to doing the posterior approach will try and preserve more tissues. And I'll say more about that uh, later on. If we look at what's being used in the United Kingdom, 
So this is the data from our national joint registry, and it's been divided into cemented, uh, uncemented and hybrid hips. And you can see if you look first of all at posterior approach, the majority with cement, with not uh, uncemented and with hybrids are through the posterior approach, about three quarters. If you add together the hard injury and the laterals, about 30%, 20 to 30% are done using the so-called direct lateral uh, type approach. And very few uh, at the moment with the direct anterior approach, as you can see here. Uh, the trochanteric osteotomy, as we may expect, is um, a lost art. And many of you senior people will remember uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a lot of noise about minimally invasive surgery, which was really just defined by the length of the skin incision. And I don't think we've really updated that um, definition, but you can see it was a fad and has really gone out and most surgeons do not admit to using it now. So 98% or so, so, so say they don't do, classify their surgery as minimally invasive. Would that be the same with you, Martin? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the same. So what do we want? We want enough exposure, although the old teaching that you want to see the entire circumferal rim of the acetabulum, I think is not necessary and we can discuss that. We want to reduce morbidity, particularly with the posterior approach, um, the, the risk of dislocation. And we, I didn't put it on the slide, but we want to improve the function of the patients and their patient reported outcome measures. We want uh, the exposure to the extensile and of course, we want to avoid neurovascular injury. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the anatomy around the hip uh, and then talk about these approaches, just briefly the transgluteal, but not for long, for the reasons I've discussed, and then go and look at the anterior and posterior approaches and their tissue sparing uh, ones that you could do using those approaches. And then finally, looking at the use of robotics and tissue sparing approaches. So Martin, I don't know whether you want to pick on somebody to, um, to let me know who, which on this slide, I've designated these insertions of A, B, and C. And this isn't to embarrass anyone, but I would guess that about 90% of surgeons, including hip surgeons, are not always aware of the anatomy at the top end of the femur. So I don't know, is there a way of voting on Zoom by a show of hands? Uh, we, yeah, they can show hands, or okay. I, can, I, can, uh, I can choose one. Okay, well, if you could choose, perhaps choose somebody to tell me who, what A is. What is the insertion A? Fernando Diaz Dilernia, can you answer this? Yes, how are you? Good morning. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, which tendon is inserted into this position A that you can see here? So it's this position here, which is the same as this one here, uh, which is the same as this one here. Yes, I think it is the pyramidalis. Piriformis. Piriformis. Yeah. Yes, piriformis. You are absolutely right. Hang on a minute. Oops. You're absolutely right. So there is piriformis. So it's quite cranial and it's posterior to B, which is um, one of the other short external rotators. Martin, do you want to choose somebody? Yeah. Let me choose. Marcos La Torre. Are you there, Marquitos? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, I think is the um, uh, gluteus minor. Ah, well, not. Wouldn't, you wouldn't be right there because that's obturator internus. And I'm not asking people to, for these because to put them on the spot, but I think if of all the people I went to see who were operating doing the direct anterior approach, who were senior surgeons, most of them would get these wrong. I, I, I truly believe that uh, because we don't routinely see them and expose them. And so with the appreciation of where these things in is not always correct. So we always see the books in the diagrams with piriformis, obturator internus, and then obturator externus. But actually, if you look very closely uh, by this excellent Japanese paper of where they're inserted, you can see that uh, obturator internus, which is the star, is more anterior and more distal to piriformis. So mm -hmm. C um, is uh, gluteus medius. So gluteus medius is on the outside of the trochanter, really. And on the inside are these short external rotators. And then the other one, of course, that's of interest is D, 
which is here, which is obturator externus, which is always in the same position. Um, but I think it's important to appreciate these because whatever tissue sparing approach you do, you need to know which tissues you're preserving and what their function is. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. And so I've put piriformis on here. And what a lot of surgeons don't appreciate is that gluteus medius uh, minimus is right round on the front in this footprint that you see here. So I really make the point that I think a lot of people don't truly know what they're releasing when they're doing a lot of these tissue sparing uh, approaches. But if we go back a moment to look at the transgluteal approach, uh, it's called Watson, uh, oh, the Hardinge approach. Um, the position is with the patient supine, which I think is an advantage in terms of socket orientation. Uh, it, is, it isn't internervous, so you split between medius and the abductors and the rotator, rotators. Uh, and then, of course, you need to elevate uh, medius and minimus, maintaining this cuff. Uh, but the, there is always danger to the superior gluteal nerve. So, uh, so there, oh, hang on, yeah, yeah, so this is the sorts of diagrams and you see, and this is why I think it's not going to be there in the future, because it's almost impossible to predictably and reliably repair that cuff of tissue, that we all know that it's very thin in this area here, and quite often dehisses. And I don't think in the future we will continue to see an approach to the hip that goes through two of the major abductors, two of the major uh, muscles that uh, lead to function of the hip. What about the posterior approach? Well, of course, that's not internervous either, as you know. Uh, we split gluteus maximus uh, and, so it, it, uh, and then divide the short external rotators. We superficially, we divide fasci uh, the fascia lata and split the fibers of gluteus maximus. And then as we will discuss, we detach these other muscles off the posterior trochanter and quite often now preserve these and put a a, a stay suture in them to put them back and then it's very extensile so you can take all of quadratus firmus I think without any detriment and you can take gluteus maximus and so you can go right down the, uh, the femur uh, if you wish to. So these are the sorts of pictures that you would see with the so-called mini posterior approach where basically you put a, a retractor under uh, gluteus medius and then divide all of the ex short external rotators put a cuff of, uh, um, use this cuff to repair, usually through drill holes at the back of the trochanter. And I think there's copious evidence that that really does help um, reduce the dislocation rate uh, afterwards. And the other good thing about the posterior approach is that you get a really good vision down the femur. You can elevate it enough that you don't go from front to back, which is what you are quite often do with the direct lateral approach. So that as you put the implant in, because of the way the femur is orientated in your exposure, you're very often introducing all of the instruments, the brooches, and the final implant from front to back. And I'm sure, Martin, you'll remember the days with the, with the Charnley, where you very often saw an area of endosteal bone lysis at the tip posteriorly, uh, because the implant was put in and was touching the posterior cortex at the back. So one of the advantages of the posterior approach is you, you do get a good run down the femur to make sure that you have a good cement mantle. If we look at the patient reported outcome measures after the lateral approach and compare that with the anterior and posterior lateral approaches, uh, I think there is evidence. Of course, if you mine the literature enough, you can get confirmation, your own confirmation bias um, uh, ratified that the, you can find papers that will support what you want them to support. But I think there is a, quite a lot of evidence now coming out that the, that the direct lateral approach is not as good. And this certainly showed that at between one and three years, the limping occurred twice as often with the lateral approach as those that underwent uh, either the anterior or the posterior lateral approach. Uh, although there weren't any significant patient reported outcomes. And I think that is the other problem we have. We have such a good operation that to find an outcome measure that is sensitive enough to actually prove real clinical benefit actually is quite, uh, is quite difficult. But I, but I think that we're going to find the, the direct lateral going. Which brings us on really to these tissue sparing approaches. And I'll say a little bit about the direct anterior because that is what took me on to um, look at this, what we're calling the spare approach. So the direct anterior has become very popular in those uh, countries 
where the surgeons are competitive with each other for business and where surgery is what I should call fashion-led. Um, and so there is where there's competitive need. Uh, people take this up so that they can maintain their, their patients coming to them. And I think in a large number of countries that has driven it. But also I think there are those, for instance, Michael Nogler in um, Innsbruck, who will tell you that he moved to it because he became unsatisfied with the direct lateral and he wanted to go anterior rather than posterior. And I think there are definite advantages to doing that, uh, but it's not an easy transition. So I think there are centers in the world now that you will go to as a resident and you will only see the direct anterior approach and it will become uh, fairly easy to you and you will do that for the rest of your life. And that I'm sure we will find. So if you, for instance, go to Philadelphia and to see Hozak, uh, you will see that throughout your training and I'm sure those surgeons, that generation of surgeons will continue to do the direct anterior approach because it does have some benefits over um, the direct lateral approach. No question about that. Um, it, there is a danger for the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, but I'm not sure that's such a big problem as people make out. If you do a longitudinal incision, then I think uh, there's, the cosmesis is not so good, but you can do it through a bikini approach. So a cut along Langer's lines, which is quite elegant. The patient again is on the back. Uh, you can use a special table that you can apply traction and extend, but that would make it uh, unsustainable, certainly in our country, because you need the expense of a table and you need a technician to use it and another assistant. So I think that really will not gain traction in most markets. And I think probably the same in Argentina. I see you nodding your head, Martin. Exactly the same, yeah. But it is possible to do it without a table. And if you go to Innsbruck or you go and see to, uh, to Philadelphia, it's done very elegantly without a table. And so it is possible. But I must Paolo say- is used, Paolo is using it without the table. Is he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and without the x-rays, intraoperative x-rays. Yes, very good point. Because a lot of people, because of the worry about positioning, also use intraoperative x-rays. So it is, uh, it is quite difficult to do. And um, I did it 20 times. I, we wanted to develop some instruments for the Exeter system. And so I went to see surgeons on almost all continents. Uh, I went to, and I was mentored by three of these senior surgeons uh, three times in my own hospital. I did multiple cadaver courses. And I can tell you, it's not an easy transition if you're used to a different approach. And you cannot learn it from a book or even I think from a few cadavers. And I think if you're going to learn it not uh, during your residency or not on a fellowship, uh, then you really need to be formally mentored and, um, and undergo significant training because there's no doubt from the literature that you can cause a lot of morbidity. And just as an aside, um, the reason I stopped doing it was because firstly, uh, I don't think it conferred the clinical advantage that was claimed because I think we'd progressed enough with the posterior approach that patients were getting up just as quickly and going home without any uh, restrictions on their lives. Uh, I learned the anatomy around the hip much better. And most of the time when I saw surgeons doing this, uh, they divided everything inside. It may have been tissue sparing on the way in, but you could throw a hand grenade into the trochanter because everything came off because you need to uh, raise the femur up. And most of the surgeons that I saw really didn't know what they were releasing. And so they would very often take all of the short external rotators. And sometimes the exposure is uh, so difficult that you actually need to take the posterior capsule and obturator externus as well. So there was a wide variety of what was released. Uh, the very best surgeons uh, took obturator internus probably 60% of the time, uh, but very variable. Uh, but others, it was, um, you know, I saw trochanters coming off. I saw all sorts of, sorts of morbidity visiting uh, surgeons. But the real thing that put me off it uh, was the fact that there was an incidence of uh, groin pain that I had not seen with the posterior approach. And talking to other surgeons, at, um, I remember seeing Jean-Pierre Simon in um, Belgium. Uh, and he said, I said, this is very impressive. Is, do you think this is the real thing? And he said, I don't think it will be because of the incidence of groin pain. And if you talk carefully to people who do the direct anterior approach, uh, there's no question that even if you preserve the anterior capsule, they do see this. And I had two patients who had intractable groin pain, one of whom 
brought me she three sheets of A4 about how I'd ruined her life. And at that point, I thought I will go back to doing something different. Um, but uh, the incision can be longitudinal. It does go between TFL uh, and sartorius. It is an internervous uh, approach. Uh, you can do it without a table. Uh, and you can do it through a relatively small incision, as you see here. So uh, there are some good things about it. But these sorts of pictures really do not give you the idea that, it, that it's very deep to get this femur elevated into the wound. And it's really quite difficult to do that. You're in danger of going from front to back as with a direct lateral approach. And it's really difficult. You can't understand the three dimensions of it looking at planar pictures like this. Uh, and so it is something that you, you really have to work at uh, to get. Um, if we look at it, the evidence for using uh, anterior or posterior lateral approaches after hip replacement, there are some quite good studies now in the literature. This was um, looking at 12,000 uh, um, primary hips after three months, and they really didn't demonstrate any superiority of either approach. And I think this partly goes back to what we were talking about with uh, not having very good outcome measures uh, that can tell the difference. And uh, they make the very good point that until more rigorous randomized evidence is available, uh, we should choose our surgical approach based on the patient, our own experience and training indeed, and the patient uh, preference. And I think that's uh, fairly true. But this um, appreciation of the anatomy around the hip uh, really led to questioning whether we really needed to release these tendons at the top end of the femur. So do all of, for the last three, nearly four years now, I've done all routine primary cases using the so-called SPARE technique, which stands for saving piriformis and internus with repair of externus. Um, and um, I'll just look at this paper again that I looked, quoted earlier, because they not only, uh, they worked out the footprint of where these tendons are. And what I'd like you to see from this is that it's quite variable with the obturator internus and with piriformis. Obturator externus is almost always in the same position, predictably so. There's a var variability in the footprint here. But if you can imagine putting a stem into antiversion, there is an area here that is outside the footprint of obturator internus and distal to the footprint of piriformis. So you, if you're putting the stem in antiversion, you can get into this area of the trochanter to go down the femur with your implant without releasing obturator internus or piriformis, or at least taking very little of the footprint of it if you take that area of bone uh, very carefully. Uh, and this was another uh, important paper, I think, from Norway, where they looked at the uh, so-called short external rotators, and they called them the quadriceps coxide because uh, they thought they, they were very similar and that they had overlapping functions, insertions, and innovations. And therefore, they looked at the function of these things to see what they did. And they make the case that rather than being truly external rotators of the hip, they act primarily with when the hip is in a flexed position, and they act both to extend and abduct the hip from a flexed position. And may be important on um, weight bearing rising and propulsive motions. And I would also add that, that these are also stabilizers of the hip. That if you can imagine the long um, tendons and muscles of the leg that go part between the pelvis and, uh, and, the, leg and the thigh and the leg, um, but if you've got the short external rotators uh, holding the joint in place, making it feel more stable, then they allow uh, the long muscles to work more effectively. And as a purely anecdotal tale, I'll tell you about one patient who I had he was in his 30s. I had performed on him one hip replacement using the routine posterior approach. And he was absolutely delighted with it. He came back. I did a spare technique on the other side. And just anecdotally, I asked him before he went home after a couple of days, I said, can you feel any difference? And he said, yes, this spare one's much better. I'm sure he wanted me. To, he knew I wanted him to say that. But I said, well, in what way is it better? He said, well, this one, it was great. But in the beginning, it was like a slab of meat. I couldn't control it. And it made me realize that actually, if you've got some strong tendons actually holding the joint packed, then it feels better for the patient and um, may be used important on, um, on function. But that's just anecdote. But if we look at the, these tendons as they come into the trochanter, so we've taken away the femur here. 
Uh, this obviously is uh, piriformis. Uh, here is uh, obturator internus and the two gemelli, and here is obturator externus. With a, that is the interval you go to with a routine posterior approach. So you divide everything uh, distal to that, uh, that line. My colleagues, uh, a lot of them do what they call the sprint approach, which is saving piriformis with the repair of internus. So that they save piriformis. It's not, Graham may be able to say something about that. It's not something I did because uh, it's quite a weak muscle, I found, and would quite often be patchless at the end of the uh, technique. So really I want to preserve the obturator internus and go in this interval. So keeping the gemelli and, um, and just taking externus. Uh, Graham, I see you've popped up there. So I'm sure there are techniques to keep to keep in piriformis without avulsing it. Do you, do you want to say something? Um, yes, absolutely. Now, um, they did some studies in um, um, Adelaide. Um, I got it, the prof there. Oh God, his name slipped my mind now. Um, Bill Walter? Just, no, in Adelaide. Um, oh, golly. Anyway, um, he, he, following hearing from me, he started preserving piriformis and he found, uh, in the, well, they were doing some research and doing some studies in the laboratory as well and showed that often piriformis avulsed in the, in the sciatic notch. And the, and the key to it there was that you had to run a blade or a pair of scissors about three centimeters from its insertion posteriorly between it and the superior gemellus was this, there was always a, a, a band of, of tissue that went from the um, piriformis down to internus. And if you released that, piriformis actually sprung up a little bit. And if you just kept going posteriorly, obviously just being a bit careful and don't go too far and catching the nerve, then, then you could keep the tension off, um, off piriformis. And I actually found, well, since from 1995 on, I hardly ever cut piriformis. I used to cut it in, um, optra, uh, in uh, protrusio cases. But from about 2003 onwards, I never even I never even cut in protrusio cases, and I found it extremely easy uh, to do with very very occasional avulsion of the uh, of the tendon. Okay. Well, well, I was keen to keep obturator internus because it is a thicker tendon, and also the direction that it comes in is different. So, in terms of stabilizing the hip, uh, there was a one of the Scottish surgeons, and we had a discussion. And we agreed that you've either got to keep obturator internus or externus. He kept externus. Uh, I keep intense, but I think they're the ones that will really try and prevent the hip dislocating because of the, the line of pull and the fact they are really strong uh, tendons. Um, so we've got some instruments to facilitate this technique. The good news is that they're inexpensive and if we ever didn't make any money out of them, it goes to our research funds. So do buy as many sets as you wish to, uh, but they do make it much easier to do this. And uh, they're made by a company called Platts and Nisbet and on their website, they've got a lot of videos which are also on View Medi, where I've segmented the various bits of the operation. I'll just show you a quick run through of it now, uh, how to do it. John, sorry, I might have I might have missed it. I was listening. Um, did you mention that if you're going to start using this technique, it's a, it's a very easy to do in neck of femur fractures? I didn't mention that, but that is absolutely right. So, all of the um, all surgeons, all hip, the hip surgeons in Exeter, do the spare technique on all hemiarthroplasties because the biggest problem with this technique is acetabular exposure, which of course you don't need with the hemiarthroplasty. So we are, John Charity is uh, running a uh, NIHR funded, so a nationally funded randomized prospective study, multi-center of the spare approach for hemiarthroplasty versus direct lateral, which is what the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence tell us we should be using. And that's about halfway through at the minute. And, uh, and I think that will show, uh, I hope that will show a significant benefit uh, but that, you're absolutely right, Graham. To get used to the dissecting in that interval, that is the group to uh, to start with. Well, there's no and, scarring. It's just so nice and, and relaxed and, and flexible, isn't it? Yeah. And if yeah. you remind me at the end, I'll spell out the other ones to start with with a um, with a total hip replacement. So the patient setup and draping is uh, quite important. So I've just got a short video showing this up uh, because um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, and um, you do need, I use a thing called a tremano. You know, the, the shoulder surgeons use uh, something that holds the arm called a tremano. You can use some other leg, uh, su leg support, the spider, or you could use something simpler, but it's very easy with a tremano. So I'll just show you how the patient is set up and draped. I think the sound on this, uh, if it doesn't work, let me know and I'll speak to it. But I think I'll have to turn my sound off otherwise. So I'll just start it up.
Okay, so the patient set up in the lateral decubitus position. It's important to know where the pelvis is. So we clamp the pelvis between the sacrum and two pads, one on the top anterior superior ilex spine and one on the bottom. And you can feel where the two spines are in relation to each other to know whether the patient is rolled back or forward. So we'd like to have them above each other. And from the frontal plane, if you feel the pubis as well, you can know the frontal plane of the pelvis. The other important points are that you need, uh, we're going to put a chain on the anterior retractor. We're going to wrap the tray chain around another upright, which is nearer to the head. And we use a, uh, something to hold the leg, such as a Tremano, that we can rotate in to hold the leg in flex flexion, slight abduction, and variable rotation. So during exposure of the socket, the leg will be in, around this position held by the Tremano. So we rehearse that before we start. Check on leg lengths. Apply the Mayo Clover on top of the Tremano in sterile fashion. And then having put the Mayo Clover on, put a utility drape over sideways to cover the whole appliance. Then we drape in normal fashion with a U drape. Okay, that's just, uh, so this is now I'm going to show you the expo. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> Did you hear that all right, Martin? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I so this is, a this is a right hip. I'll point it out as we go along, but this retractor on the left here is under the edge of gluteus medius, uh, showing piriformis, obturator internus, and then quadratus down here. So let me just, you can see the incision's about 12 centimeters. And the side Sorry, do you go more posterior than a Gibson approach or just the same? No, the same really, okay. it's the same. So you see the side, no. so we've gone in the interval between the inferior gemellus and quadratus femoris, and you can run a finger up, take any um, adhesions off the uh, capsule. If this assistant lifts, externally rotates the hip a little bit, it makes some space there, and you can just run a periosteal elevator, and then this special bent homan goes up over the top of the femoral head, and then, you're going to make the capsular incision exactly as you would do with a posterior approach. So it'll be to about 11, uh, 11 o'clock using a long diathermy and cutting along the neck uh, inwards outwards until you get to the gap between the head and the uh, acetabulum. But do it completely under direct vision or you'll cut the internus which is behind this retractor. Um, and so uh, then you can dislocate it by fully flexing, adducting and internally rotating. It pops out underneath the inferior gemellus. And then the rest of it is just routine at this point. You cut the head in the way that you would normally do it. Um, and then this is the clever bit. So you put, walk this up, the anterior retractor over the front, then you flex the leg up. Um, let me just stop it there for a second. So what I've done is you flex the leg up to about 80 to 90 degrees abduct it to about neutral abduction. And then what I'm gonna do is play with this anterior retractor and the leg and the tibia and just rotate it and find the position that uh, the femur is out of the way best when pulling on this anterior retractor. Uh, so I'll start it up again. So, uh, and then yeah, you put that chain on, as I mentioned earlier, and now there are some bent trothowans that you can use uh, to get underneath all around the rim of the acetabulum. Uh, and so you can see the position of the leg here, and you basically go in this, in this vector between the anterior retractor and the inferior retractor over the transverse ligament. There's also a self-retaining retractor, which has a longer arm posteriorly, which pulls on the posterior capsule, and a more superficial, smaller arm anteriorly, which pulls on the obturator internus tendon or the trochanter. Uh, but basically you work in that area. Quite often you need to take the inferior retractor out um, because you, you need the space to get to it. And then you can make the drill holes and do whatever you need. So it is tighter and it's actually much more easy to use a uncemented cup than a cemented cup. So here I am cementing. But because the cup introducer is uh, in the vector of the cup, it's much easier to put an uncemented cup in. Uh, but I'll just show you this. So multiple drill holes, the aspirator retractor that you mentioned, that uh, you mentioned, uh, Martin. We and call it the chupacabra. Yeah, and then I usually insert the cement from a gun, 
uh, pressurize it in the normal way. And then you have to hold the implant on because the, the only problem with the cemented cup is the introducer is, uh, is a Charlie style. So you need to hold the cup on and then get it into the uh, acetabulum and orientate it. And just a word on orientation, because you've put the leg into a flexed and slightly uh, different position, the pelvis tends to open a bit and roll forwards. So you're, you don't try and close the cup as you would do routinely. You leave it at 45 degrees or it will look more closed when it comes off the table. Getting to the femur is absolutely no difficulty. In fact, it's easier than with the piriformis sparing because the way that obturator internus is inserted into the trochanter, it pulls piriformis out of the way and protects it. So basically you work uh, under le leaving the footprint of those two tendons intact. And one thing that I find you definitely need is this high speed burr that helps you get into that bare area that I mentioned to you in the trochanter. And so you can preserve the footprint of obturator internus and piriformis uh, by doing that. And then the, the preparation really is just the same, but I won't actually do this operation without the high speed burr because it's so important to get into that area predictably and, and to develop that, um, that window. So now we do a reduction, check leg length, check stability. And the thing you'll notice if you do this is that you cannot dislocate this hip. This strap comes across the back of the, uh, the hip and um, you have to put a bone hook in to pull it underneath the short external rotators. Uh, but now you can change with the extra system, as you know, offset leg length version, you can change whatever you want uh, and cement it in. I'll, I'll move it on there so I'm not here too long. Oh, uh, and then in combination with robotics, I think is really the way forward. I mentioned to you that it's a little bit more difficult knowing where the uh, acetabulum is. Um, because of the pelvis will have moved position. Of course, that's gone if you do use the robot. So you, we use the enhanced technique. So we register both the femur and the acetabulum. So this is the uh, screw that you put in the trochanter to put the navigation array on the femur. You have a checkpoint position and then you teach the robot where the, the femur is. And so that the robot then knows the whole geometry of the proximal femur. It takes four or five minutes to do this. It really is very, very swift and easy once you're used to doing it. Um, and then it, it to you have to pop these balloons, these final balloons, and then it has registered the femur. So when you come to do the reduction, it knows the antiversion, it knows your leg length, and it knows the combined offset of them both. And then in the acetabulum, you can make a drill hole for your um, uh, checkpoint, and then you basically do the same thing. Uh, you've put an array on the pelvis incidentally beforehand and you basically teach by touching these points on the acetabulum teach the robot where the uh, pelvis is in space you then pop these balloons to check that you've done it well and then you have to ream in a certain position it shows you where you're reaming it shows you your position and when it turns red you stop and it is incredibly accurate uh, there are some instruments to help you get these reamers in and out and then, as I mentioned, it's much easier with an uncemented cup. You go in, you can put the, uh, the cup through the soft tissues. You can take all of the retractors out if you wish to. And when you put the cup in, the robotic arm holds it in exactly the correct orientation. It will not move from that orientation. Uh, and you hammer it down and it gives you a distance remaining that you can see here. It won't move and um, it's within a degree or two absolutely every time. So there you are, 44.17 actual and planned. It's uncanny how accurate it is. And then you just remove it. Uh, you can just look at the position, put, put in the, um, the liner, and then by using the navigating arm on the face of the liner, you can just double check that you are absolutely where you thought you would be. And then this again makes the point, use the high speed burr, accurately get out uh, to get down the canal, don't go mad with it, but take whatever you need to get that slot of bone uh, and then uh, do the sizing. You can put obviously as much version as you want to and change the version and measure it with the robot. So this is the beauty of it. If you use the enhanced technique, which most surgeons don't because the uncement, people who use an uncemented femoral component cannot change version. So they don't bother with this. But by doing this, you can put an array on the brooch uh, and there's the array on the femur. And you can check the anti-version of the brooch. Of course, when you put the implant in, you can change that if you want to, to give it more or less. 
and it gives you a readout of combined version as well as leg length and offset. And then you cement in exactly the same way as before. Um, retrograde insertion of cement, pressurization, and then inserting the stem. And I'm sure the next generation of robot will do a lot of this for you. So you can imagine you could burr out the top end of the femur to allow to put the brooch, and you could actually navigate when you put the stem in. But you can check your final uh, stem position, uh, orientation, and uh, it's got us so that we're not happy if the um, thing is not within a couple of millimeters in terms of leg length, in fact. So here's an interoperative one that I did. You can see that the cup inclination is exact. I was, it was a degree out from actual and planned in terms of version. The combined versions here, the stem was 19 degrees antiverted, but it was too long and I had increased the combined offset. So the beauty of um, the extra system, of course, is you can change all of these things by uh, changing the head. So I managed to get it uh, absolutely perfect uh, for the final thing. And it gives you an idea of what the x-ray will look like at the end. So just in uh, um, summary, with a direct anterior approach, you take the anterior capsule and the variable number of the external rotators. With the direct superior, which I haven't discussed today, but um, strikers certainly are pushing a little bit, you take piriformis in almost every case on obturator and turnus. And that was really built on the uh, on trying to stop splitting um, uh, the fascia over the hip. But the spare, the only tendon you take is externus, and uh, I do take quadratus femoris, but of course that's a, a muscle. And really, this is what I do routinely now in my primary hips, extra hip in absolutely all cases, spare in all routine cases, uh, and the Mako uh, I use in every case I can. So I think um, I'm very happy to take any questions, Martin, on, uh, on approaches. We can't hear you, Martin. Martin, you, we can't hear you. Great presentation, John. Thank you very much. Graham, you want to say something to complement this? No, I think John has covered um, everything. I would just um, recommend that anybody who's trying to do this, just try it on the femoral neck fractures. And you just don't have to worry about dislocation. It's quite remarkable, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, two other points. Can I make two other points? Firstly. Of course, if you find you are struggling, just divide the tendons. So don't put the patient at risk. There is a learning curve. If you're really struggling, just cut them and you're back to your routine posterior approach. Sure. Sure. And the other point to make is that the ones to start on are the more elderly are easier, those with valgus necks and a large offset. So if you've got a, a valgus neck, a large offset uh, in somebody relatively elderly, especially a woman, they're the ones to start with and you'll find them easy. And there are some that are really difficult, and, but as I say, don't put the patient at risk, just cut them. It is made easier, no question, by the use of the robot. John, there are some questions coming from the audience. Yeah. Do you think as you preserve the tendons, maybe the, there, there would be a higher rate of virus stems or horizontal caps? Uh, yes, well, the, well, if we look at the stems first of all, um, I think we're aware of the fact that um, there is a danger, which is why I use that high speed burr. I think it is essential to get out so that you're in the neutral position. And so you do go a little bit more around the corner than if you cut all the tendons. Uh, but the, use the high speed burr and just be aware of it. And I, I don't think I have uh, put them in more various, but, but that is because I'm aware of it. Uh, but, it but because if you make that slot in the lateral trochanter, uh, you are outside the footprint of those important external rotators. Uh, you're safe to go out laterally. And, and uh, so I think the various stem is not a problem. I think socket positioning is more of an issue. I think it's very important that the surgeon should position the patient themselves so they know where the pelvis is and be aware of how tight it is and what movement of the pelvis there might have been when you put the hip onto the trimana. And what happens most of the time is the pelvis opens a little bit and probably rolls forward a bit. So make sure for the, um, in, uh, for the anti-version that you use the towel, the, you know, the ligament as an indication. And I would say that don't try, you know, normally you try and close it a bit towards the floor, thinking you'll close the cup. If the pelvis is open and you do that, it will be very flat cup. So err on the side of not doing that. But I think the biggest problem with this technique is the inclination of the cup, not so much antiversion because you've got the towel, you know, the transverse ligament, but the inclination. So 
Um, so take all the steps you do to recognize how the pelvis has moved. I mean, you could, for instance, put a, a, um, a pin in the pelvis and see how much it opens when you move the leg. Um, so there are ways around it, uh, but th that is something you need to be aware of. It's a good question. Good. We don't have speed bursts in primary surgery and not, we don't have them. Do you still do the, the tip that you, you taught me to, to work the lateral part of the femur with a, with a brooch, with a rasp? Yes, you can do that. The other technique thing you can do is, you know, there is always that bit of bone laterally in the trochanter, isn't there? That you need to get into once you've taken the slot of bone out. So what I do is take that slot of trabecular bone and then an undercut, if you like, the little bit of cortex laterally and use a curved nibbler to nibble out as laterally as I can in the trochanter. And then, as you say, you could use a, a small offset one, which is smaller, to get in there and rasp away laterally. I mean, with the birds, they, if you use a Sebatome or a Black Max or something like that, they are very, pretty expensive. But the TPS, which does happen to be a striker instrument, they're quite inexpensive. I think they're used by the foot and ankle surgeons mainly because you don't need a lot of power. And the tips of those are quite inexpensive. So those are the ones that we use. And uh, so that hasn't added a lot of expense to it. Good. Any problems with the quadratus? Any tears of the quadratus femoralis? You yeah, I don't mind taking that. You know, it's, it's a muscle, not a tendon. And I like to see the less trochanters. So I divide most of it, most of the time. You could preserve it if you feel it's important, but I don't think it has much function. So I pretty much uh, divide that with, 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 without worrying about it. Do you still do the release of the anterior capsule with that chicken scissor that made oh, me no. some nightmares? No, no, not no? at all. No, you know, yeah. I, did my, I did my PhD looking at impingement and quite often release the anterior capsule off the wing of the ilium and the iliofemoral ligament. And sometimes when it impinged host host, when you're testing the stability of the hip, excising the anterior capsule, if you leave that posterior, those posterior structures in place, it can't dislocate. So the other thing I learned very quickly is that the thing that stops the excursion of the hip is either impingement or soft tissue tether. So if you consider the movement of the hip, we don't circumduct our hip through 360 degrees. Although if you externally rotated your hip, you, you, you potentially could. So the question is what stops it? And it's, it's either soft tissue tether or impingement. And so if you leave the tether at the back of the hip holding it in, that when it impinges at the front, the head can't lift out. And I think we all do impinge. So one thing I learned quickly doing the direct anterior approach is that when you're doing a, from the direct anterior, you're doing a trial reduction, you put your finger in as you flex the hip in, and there's very little clearance when you're in full flexion, and you'll catch your finger every time, it's very painful. And so you realize the clearance is very little. So I think we naturally either impinge or our soft tissues get tight, and by leaving these structures intact, you rarely have to do, unless there's some abnormality of the soft tissue, you rarely have to do any of those anterior releases to the capsule at all. Good. Do you have any MRIs to confirm this um, preservation of the, of the tendons in the short or long term? No, we've been doing, we've got a, a higher Tesla machine coming in soon and we've, we've got some studies, um, we're planning to do that, but we have not yet done them. So at the moment, we're applying for some national funding to a randomized prospective study of um, posterior approach versus spare approach using MAKO, uh, trying to get national funding for that. Um, the problem we have, as you know, is that getting the correct outcome measure is incredibly difficult. We can't use dislocation. We'd need thousands of patients, thousands. Patient reported outcome measures, they've all got a ceiling effect. So we're trying to look at activity monitoring, gait, and MRI will be three things that we'll try and look at. Yeah, Although I think we'll actually have to power the study on some sort of prom or some simple, um, some simple exercise. Good. Okay. I think we don't have any more questions. Okay. Uh, if you want, Graham, do you want to share your screen? Yep. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, so we should see the yeah on there. Yeah, that's right. Okay. 
Um, Martin, just hearing you ask about the uh, what we call, used to call the chicken scissors or the anterior capsule scissors, you need to come visit us again. I think we, it shows how long since you came to see us. It's been tw more than 20 years since we uh, stopped using that. So uh, you need to come and say hello again. That still <laughs> caused me some nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so basically I want to give you a bit of an update on infection uh, bone grafting. I thought I'd cover a little bit in the, um, in the femur and show you a technique that John introduced to try and help us get better results, or must be close on 10, maybe 12 years, even more 12 years ago now. Um, and also just to go through femoral impaction and uh, the cases we use it, we use it on, um, on today. I'm not going into um, the detail of results um, the worldwide experience with impaction bone grafting of the acetabulum is now more than 40 years and the femur is uh, 33 years. Uh, so there's clear evidence it works and there's lots of publications, uh, you know, new chaps have published uh, as well from there quite extensively. You know, Martin, I was interested to hear that I knew you guys had done it before we published our paper. I didn't quite realize it had been done so soon after we did it. You know, what would be quite interesting is, um, because the first case I did, I was still a trainee actually at the time, and you know, it was two primaries in the morning, keep the two femoral heads and do a hip replacement, put them in the fridge, do a hip replacement in the afternoon and impact bone graft with no laboratory research, just, oh, this will be a good idea, slip sting it in the socket, let's try it in the femur, and away we, um, we went. And, you know, not having any instruments to do it with, we were sort of finding our feet as we went and trying to cement in the, put cement down the femur when you had such a narrow canal and you didn't have a narrow cement gun. It was quite interesting sucking the cement down, et cetera, et cetera. It would be very interesting to know, because I can recall exactly how I did that first case, how your surgeon who did the first case actually, um, actually did it and see what, I wonder if we did it the same way or whether we each had our own different technique. It just might be interesting to find out. Anyway, so much for that. Um, so we have a long experience of both uh, uh, techniques and I thought I'd just go through um, the impaction grafting in both primary surgery and revision uh, surgery. Now, as you can see, I put the femur in brackets for primary uh, surgery because it is very, very rare to use it in, in primary surgery and I'll get that out the way first. So although it is extremely rarely used in primary cases, I think it needs to be seriously considered in some cases. And I used to use it in, or a, uh, a method similar to it in the very elderly patients where I didn't rasp the femur. These were very elderly patients with either very wide canals or very thin cortices or both, um, or otherwise in inflammatory arthritic patients you know, who had extremely soft cancellous bone and um, extremely thin cortices, uh, although often these cases had very narrow canals, but if they had a wide canal, I think IBG in primary was a good idea. So in a primary, uh, you would not use any rasping at all. And all you do is take uh, the first or the largest femoral impactor, which would go into the canal um, and just tap it very gently, because of course you don't hit it too hard, you'll fracture the femur, just to compress the cancellous bone and then proceed with cementing. Or if the canal was very wide, mill the, the autologous femoral head and impact the, um, impact the bone. As I say, very few cases, but certainly uh, work quite well, particularly in the elderly where you didn't want to use masses of, um, of cement in these huge, um, huge canals. So, so much for impaction bone grafting in the femur and primaries. So, I accept entirely that unsmented acetabular fixation has become the treatment of choice. It's even become John Timperley's treatment of choice because he's using the spare approach and he can't see the hell see what he's doing. Um, so, he, he's, he's had to uh, change to cementless components um, and used to, he used to have a real go at me for using cementless components all those years ago. Oh, um, the old polygram. Uh, that's true. That's, yeah, that's true. I'm just having a go at you. Um, <laughs> so I accept entirely that cementless fixation has become the treatment of choice. And with the good poly, as John has mentioned, um, they are doing extremely well. But I still think we need to have or to be able to use cemented fixation because it is useful in certain situations. And in fact, in some situations, I would say you really should use it in preference 
to cement asphyxiation. And one of them is the elderly. I mean, there's clear evidence arising that if patients over the, eight, over the eight, age of 80 and perhaps even 75, that you should cement all those uh, acetabuli. You certainly should cement the femur to reduce the risk of periprosthetic uh, fracture. And in contained defects, including protrusio, and also where excessive reaming is required for cement asphyxiation. And two and three will often go together. And I think it's crazy sometimes when you see an oval kind of defect like this. If you think of the mouth of this um, hip or a patient's right, our left, uh, this was a previously infected uh, uh, hip replacement, um, you, you can clearly see the anterior and the posterior walls, and I've marked them out, um, out there with uh, yellow, um, yellow dots. I'm just going to get my laser pointer up here. So we can clearly see the uh, anterior and posterior wall. And the longitudinal or vertical direction of the acetabulum is significantly more than the AP diameter. So this head has migrated upwards and inwards. And the AP diameter is a lot, lot shorter than the vertical diameter. And if you start reaming this up to fit an uncemented cup in there, number one, you're going to put a pretty big cup in. And two, you're probably going to take away most of the anterior wall. Now, yes, you can still get good fixation. You can still put some screws in and make it nice and, and, and tight, but you will lose bone. And if the patient's 90 years old, does it really matter? But you should probably be cementing a 90-year-old anyway. But if the patient's 50 or 60, that's the last thing you really want to, um, want to do. So I'd say this is an ideal case for uh, impaction bone grafting. And our experience with cases uh, where we have not required mesh, where there have been cavitary defects, and this applies to both primary and revision surgery, at 10 years is actually 100%. So these simply do not uh, fail. To the extent that in Nijmegen now, they are impaction bone grafting all acetabuli in their patients under the age of 50. Now, the problem with that is that you, you then don't store bone for your bone bank. Now, they don't have their own bone bank. They buy bone in. We have our, bone, our own bone bank, so it's important for us to have bone available. But it's actually a very good idea because you actually increase the bone stock at the primary surgery, and by the time the hip fails, hopefully not, but when it does fail, you're back to where you started. Um, anyway, I think it's extremely important, and in this case, you'd have had to take a lot of bone away, and we're putting a lot of bone uh, back in. I'm not sure what age this patient uh, was. And there you see six years uh, later, it's always, always looking pretty, um, pretty good with incorporation of, um, uh, of bone, and this patient, in fact, did, uh, did very well. So um, that's all I really want to say in, in, in primary situations. Uh, Certainly in our hospital, we've increased the use of cementless fixation. I use cementless fixation an awful lot. It, it did me extremely well after the good poly came along. I actually, interestingly, I started using it before we really understood how bad the, bad the old poly was. And in the late 1990s, I actually moved back to cemented fixation until decent poly was, uh, was available. So in the 1990s, for about five years, I used um, cementless, realized there was a problem after five years and went back to cemented, uh, cemented sockets. So, um, although uncemented fixation in revision surgery has also become the treatment of, of choice, there's no doubt that cemented fixation should be used in certain situations. And it's unfortunate that around the world, there are some centers where, doc where surgeons have no idea how to use cement, have never even seen cement, never smelt uh, cement, and they will just blunder on with cementless fixation in cases where cement should be used. And when should we use it? Well, there's no doubt that we should use it in young patients. It's crazy if you had a 20 or 30 year old patient um, to go putting in a component that in fact uh, is going to take away more bone and be a bigger and bigger component. Um, and then what you're going to do the next time round because they'll soon get a um, pelvic dissociation. Again, it is a simple operation uh, when you have cavitary defects. And again, uh, combining with three where significant reaming is required. Why take away more bone when you can put bone back? And here's a classic example with you know, a really good outcome, quite extensive bone loss, but it's cavitary. You see the post-op x-ray after impaction bone grafting. And then here you see this lovely remodeling. That I don't know if it's how clear it is down there. You can see it, but um, of the bone uh, with no loosened lines at um, 10 years uh, down the line. Um, 
This was an infected uh, case. You can see the sinuses in the uh, femur here, here, there. Um, so it was at, at the time we were doing uh, two-stage uh, revisions. Uh, sorry, um, have I got the right case? No, that's coming in a minute. Um, but it was an infected case. Uh, you see the impaction bone grafting postoperatively. It's perhaps been a little risky. We've lateralized the socket slightly, and there perhaps is a little bit unsupported bone supralaterally. We maybe should have just popped a small mesh on there. However, here you see the patient at 18 months, and then here at um, six and a half uh, uh, years. And it's all looking pretty good. A little loosened line coming in zone one, but really under the osteophyte rather, or under a graft that's actually formed osteophyte rather than within the acetabulum uh, itself. And in these cases where, uh, again, as you see here, a cavitary defect, uh, you see the post-op, uh, and then at 10 years down the uh, line, looking absolutely perfect, it, it would be, I wouldn't say irresponsible, but you would be putting up pretty big uncemented sockets in there. And if that patient's 80 years old, that's probably not an issue. But if the patient's 50, 40, younger, uh, even my age of 68, um, you know, I'll be a lot happier to have that in than a huge uncemented cup, knowing that next time round, if there was a next time round, I'd have a pretty easy revision uh, operation. So that's the cavitary defects, and they really did extremely well. Uh, pretty much, unless you've got an infection or dislocation, pretty much 100% success rate at 10 years. The issues we had, and I know you had the same, Martin, which you published on some time ago, was with the rim meshes. Now, and you had exactly the same experience as us because you published on the, the large rim meshes as being the problem. Now, if we use the small rim meshes, and I'd probably, this is a medium, probably a medium we've used here. It's actually a large one that's been cut to a medium size. Um, they didn't do too badly, but the small rim meshes were as good as the fully contained defects. It was the large meshes that were the problem. This one here, five and a half years down the line, doing extremely uh, uh, well. But in our first 130 odd cases, we, sorry, 118 cases we did, we reviewed, uh, we had nine reoperations for aseptic loosening and 10 asymptomatic radiological failures. And all 19 of them were with the large rim meshes. So um, we did come up with ways of fixing the, the mesh uh, better. For example, we used to, you, we, when you put the screws into a large mesh, you couldn't put them across the cavity as you see here, was when you tried to impact, you were obviously hitting up against the uh, screws. So those screws you had to take out, keep out the way, um, and, and impaction bone graft. Um, what we did learn was that then after you had fixed your socket in position and cemented it in, you could then place more screws through the uh, uh, mesh, through the bone graft and into the medial uh, wall, which did help fix better and make the, the mesh stronger. However, John came up with a rather good idea. Sorry, just to show you a case. We determined the mode of failure in observing these 19 uh, cases. So if you look at this patient's left hip, there's obviously a large mesh in position, huge numbers of screws holding it in position. Despite that, the cup has migrated and tilted, although the mesh is still in position. So the mesh actually hasn't failed. It's, the, it's actually, um, failed within the graft itself. So there's been cleavage within the, um, within the, in the graft. So uh, what alternatives were there in these cases? Well, not quite such a bone preserving operation, but the best one can do under the circumstances to at least partially improve the, um, the amount of bone in the socket was to use um, the um, uh, trabecular, was to use trabecular metal. And so John, John wondered, could we use trabecular metal in impaction bone grafting by improving the supralateral support and indeed started doing it as such. A few little important points here. You impact the, the, the socket almost as you normally would, as you see in the top uh, left. And then in that supralateral defect, you apply the, um, uh, the trabecular metal wedge um, onto the bone graft. Now it's absolutely crucial that that wedge is sitting somewhere on host bone and more importantly, both touching bone, host bone anteriorly and posteriorly. So it needs to almost lock itself in there before you start putting in the, um, in the screws. When you start tightening the screws, 
you should not over tighten them. If you keep tightening, you can keep on going, going, and what will happen, the wedge will just continue moving into your impaction bone graft and be in, end up too medial, and it also often will, will tilt. So you tighten the screws sufficiently to get the trabecular metal sitting in the right position and reasonably firmly. You then continue the impaction both medially under the, under the trabecular metal and through the holes in the trabecular metal to then really get it stable. And the big difference about the socket compared to the femur, you should be using big chips. That was another reason we had problems early on. We used the milled bone like we did in the femur uh, instead of using the big chips as advised by the inventors of the procedure who were the surgeons in, um, in Nijmegen. So here you can see the bone graft um, impacted into the holes and under the medial aspect of the um, uh, wedge. And here it is cemented in uh, position. And when we did our first review, there was no doubt this had made a significant difference to our, um, to our failure rate. Here you see that case. Um, so although you've got the trabecular metal in position, you've still put a significant amount of bone graft in this case. Um, and this patient will have more bone next time around if that failure actually arises. Thus far, um, and John, when I last looked at the figures, uh, none of these had actually failed. Um, have you got any information, further information on that? I didn't have time to check on it because um, the, I was only warned of the talk a few days ago, but uh, do, you, do you have any updated data? Uh, we haven't formally looked them out. I mean, they, 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 there hasn't been a high failure rate. I mean, I think it is much better than the meshes, no question about that. Anyway, when we looked at our first three patients, uh, uh, first 33 patients, the follow-up was just beyond uh, average, was at 36 months, but, but again, up to seven years, and we hadn't had any failures in those, uh, in those uh, cases. So it seems to... Uh, have resolved the issue of um, large rim, um, rim meshes. In particular, so what have our technical advances have been? We think trabecular metal is the way forward instead of using the uh, large uh, meshes. The use of larger tips is absolutely uh, crucial. And I think we've got more and more confident over the years. And with the trabecular metal, you really can be confident about giving really vigorous impaction. And a little lesson learnt, um, we, easy to, to have learned long ago because of, uh, it's easy to work out when you look at the physics and the mechanics. If you take a, a fairly small device like this and hit it fairly firmly, you have a very large force per unit um, area. And it's very easy to actually um, impact through the medial uh, wall or break the, break the bone. Um, so we used to use these very gently to start with before moving to the, the size impactor that fits within the uh, mouth of the acetabulum. I think there's very little regain for this. What we do is we fill the socket um, and then just take an impactor that's pretty much the size. You can see this is just fitting inside the medial or the anterior and posterior walls of the uh, acetabulum and use that to impact. And you can hit that pretty hard because these, the force is now spread over the, the, si or the size of the impactor you are using. So the force per unit area is much, much smaller. If you do just go through the medial wall or the medial wall cracks, that's not an issue at all. In fact, my impression was these always healed better having caused a fracture, but it, it had to be stable. You couldn't put a socket in if the medial wall was still feeling spongy. Um, if after impaction, the medial wall still feels a bit spongy, it's a good idea to put a medial wall mesh in position, more graft and keep impacting until it is absolutely uh, stable. Okay, so that's all I really want to say about socket uh, impaction in the socket. What's the present status of femoral impaction grafting? Well, we remain, or my colleagues remain, I haven't operated for about, well, in the NHS 10 years, but privately seven years now, or six and a half years. Um, we remain just as enthusiastic, but sadly, the procedure is only really performed now. At the, at the max, we were doing about 70 to 80 uh, a year. Um, John informs me we're down to probably a dozen or so a year uh, now, but just due to lack of femoral revisions for, um, uh, for loosening. And uh, I'm sure most of you will know you have a lot of experience down that part of the world with uh, collarless polish tapered uh, stems. Um, loosening is really an extremely, extremely rare uh, phenomenon. So uh, the downside is we don't do many femoral impaction bone grafts or many femoral revisions, and especially using in cement as well. Um, we um, don't take cement out of the femur very often. What is, uh, or when should it be used? It's, it should be the procedure of choice for young and middle-aged patients where bone loss has occurred 
and or where a stem longer than a standard primary stem is being uh, considered. You don't want to go halfway or three quarters of the way down the femur in somebody who's young or middle-aged who's going to need another uh, operation and you end up with a femoral replacement or proximal femoral replacement or whatever. So preserving bone in the younger patients I think is absolutely crucial. Uh, you heard the background uh, earlier. We actually started in April 1987. Um, what, what it is, well, it's just very tight, very tight packing. I have to emphasize very tight packing because many publications have shown significant uh, substance. That's just surgeons being a bit too scared to um, uh, impact firmly. And just I'll mention a, a, a story um, Sarah Moorhead Orwood in London was doing some research, sent a fellow down to Exeter with uh, strain um, gauges built into the impactor um, to measure how hard we were impacting the bone. And after the third blow, the strain gauge burst apart and off the young lady who was doing a femoral fellowship and wanted to see several cases in Exeter, wandered back to London to go and get her strain gauges fixed. Um, came back with ones that she said were significantly more vigorous that Sarah Moorhead Orwood had tried out in several cases. And again, within five minutes of the impaction starting, we smashed her strain gauges uh, uh, again. So that was the end of that study for them, but it did show that we were packing much, much tighter than others uh, were packing. Uh, we now do have these rather nice instruments uh, to help us with the uh, procedure. And you can see in the bottom right, sometimes we end with very wide, very thick uh, bone graft, but it doesn't seem to matter because it's all um, spongy uh, and no, no cortical bone, and there's no stress protection in there, the bone does seem to heal without too much uh, uh, trouble. Uh, when it comes to cementing, the technique's exactly the same as for primary, except of course you can't wash the canal, and you have to use a narrow or tapered uh, gun spout. Uh, we want to get stability, of course, and restore the bone uh, stock. This is how we did it originally. I'm going to skip through that time's getting on. But this was one of the earliest cases. This actually was the third case we did. Um, a man of 70, um, failed McKee. You can see the lytic lesions, particularly here, but a bit of expansion of the proximal femur. But just concentrate on this lesion here. Uh, stems and varus. We had to hit the trial stems on the head to impact the bone graft, so we often drove the stem into this position here. You, and, and hitting there, you, you cause the stem, we cause the impaction graft to be in varus, and therefore the stem went in varus. But if you look at that after 16 months, and if you look at that one first, and then 16 months later, it really looks like a stem that's just been placed in varus. It looks like a primary hip replacement. So we got pretty excited early on about this technique. A, a met stem exeter, you can see fairly significant bone loss, very thin lateral cortices, fracture caused by the impaction here, um, but no problem at all. Healed beautifully by 27 months, and there at four years, wondering why you ever needed the, um, the circlage uh, wire. We had instruments introduced into 1991. This was one of the earliest cases with instruments, a 39-year-old lady who was sent to me by Mike Freeman from London. Um, Post-op, much better aligned components using the impaction and eight years down the, um, down the mine. Sorry, I just need to move my, the pictures here. I'm just blocking myself. And then, um, come on. here she is at 14 and a half uh, years. The socket is also impaction bone grafted. Um, and here she is at 26 years, so she's now 65 when this picture is taken, she was 39. Her hip trouble started when she was 19, when she suffered a neck of femur fracture in a car accident, and she'd had several hip replacements by the time she actually came to see me. Um, so there you go, pre-revision and 26 years later. Um, and I think we all would get pretty excited about seeing something like that. Now, you will see significant subsidence there. Um, we did not use big chips in the proximal femur. In those days, we learned that to reduce the amount of substance here in the proximal three centimeters two to three centimeters of the femur you should use chips the same size as the acetabulum you can get much much tighter impaction and obviously this area here and particularly this area here is the key area in getting very very tight impaction and this will prevent substance and now the substance we see is virtually the same perhaps fractionally more than we get in primary hip surgery uh, an infected case um, post-op and they're the patient at 12 uh, years, um, really looking pretty impressive with no lucent uh, lines. Um, how are we doing for time, Martin? Oh, I can't hear you. It's fine for us. We have all the time. It's fine. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so um, basically I've shown you just all st uh, short stems so far and we used only short stems for the first or at least 10 years or, or so. Um, but we had a 5% fracture rate in the first 400 and odd cases. Now, that's actually not bad when you consider it co compared to the uncemented stems in revision surgery where they probably get a 5% fracture rate on the table. Um, but for us, it was too much. So we decided to st that we, although the bone graft was, he seemed to be healing pretty quickly, patients got overconfident too quickly. And you know, in six weeks down the line, they'd come to see us and they'd say, you know, doctors feel so good. I'm walking on it. I've stopped using my crutches after three or four weeks. So we did get a fair incidence of uh, periprosthetic fractures, um, mainly at the tip of the stem. So we did move to longer stems. And here you see the reasons for using longer stems, mainly lysis at or beyond the, uh, the, uh, the tip, or even if you did an ETO. And it does work well with ETO, despite what you might have read in some papers. So lysis at or beyond the tip of component. Here you see severe lysis around it. Charnley with lysis right down to the tip of the, um, of the stem. Uh, impaction grafting using a longer uh, stem. And if you just bear in mind that, and then you see this after four, oh, there, I'll show, show the pre-op here. I mean, really quite bad bone loss. And you look here, it's, it's pretty remarkable what happens in only if the first few um, years. And this is maintained throughout the patient's um, uh, uh, life or until the cortices thin when they're very elderly. Uh, very thin quality bone. I mean, look at this. You, you know, if this is an elderly patient, sure, you could just go and um, hit a, a cone conical and get fixation down here. But you haven't got much bone proximally. Whereas with infection bone grafting, we can do that with a longer... Uh, stem, uh, circlage wires, and proximal support. Um, complex operation, but I think very necessary if the patient's a younger patient. Uh, periprosthetic fractures, where the fracture is not significantly communicated, to, to, um, um, comminuted where the stem is loose, and the stem is clearly loose uh, here. You can see very thin cortices laterally, and you can just go ahead, fix the fracture, and do a femoral impaction bone grafting using a longer, a longer stem. Um, if the femoral canal is too narrow to use a longer stem, what do we do when we really feel that impaction bone grafting should be done, but you've got a rather narrow uh, canal, as in this case here with lysis fairly close to the tip of the uh, stem? Well, then we'd keep to a short stem because we just simply can't use a longer stem and we'd fix the, um, or pass the lytic area with either a strut graft or with a, uh, a plate if, um, if preferred, and that does a, a good job. So what are the limitations um, of femoral impaction grafting? Are there any limitations? Well, there's very few limitations, actually. If you take a look at this case, this is probably one of the worst cases I, uh, I did. Um, it's a, it had a, a failed, uh, fully coated, um, uh, that's a furlong hip. Uh, they redid it with a longer furlong uh, hip. And the stem doesn't look very long, but it is very long because this is in a very flexed and adducted position, you're not seeing a true AP of this femur. You can see even before that, they had a cemented hip in, uh, in position. And you can see how close that comes to the knee. Now, what choices do you really have uh, here? I mean, you're not gonna get uncemented fixation down there, are you? you? And with the proximal femoral replacement, you really haven't got much to fix it onto. You haven't got to place very many screws or intermodality fixation. So I'd put it to you here, you're almost looking at a proximal femoral um, replacement, uh, not a proximal femoral replacement, a total femoral replacement. Anybody disagree? Any other better ideas of um, how you'd how you do this? I'm going to show you a similar case I, that I oh. operated this week. But I know okay. what you did, and I, I would did the same. I would do so the same. Thing. I decided to do femoral impaction bone grafting, really, because I thought that was about the only choice. But I had to be fairly original. Uh, in this, and it needed a lot of thought beforehand, which just shows why you shouldn't think about these things on the on the table. I actually ordered a fully um, a, a whole cadaver femur, and I cut it um, into about a third, or perhaps a little less than a third, uh, diameter uh, of that um, um, donor femur, uh, and kept and with it cut the calcar. So I had a calcar. Um, for the for the strut graft to build up, and I hammered the strut graft inside the patient's femur all the way down to the knee. Um, 
so I could make it an ordinary exposure, a small exposure at the top end rather than a huge long exposure to try and go putting plates on or circlage wires or anything like that. And you can clearly see the strut graft there inside the femur going into the better quality bone and then put a 205 millimeter stem, a fully tapered stem inside. And here you see the lateral x-ray, here you see where the strut's gone to inside. And if you blow that up, you can actually see the trabecule growing onto the strut graft, which is quite remarkable. And that was him one and a half years um, down, the, um, down the, uh, the line. So if we had to be any limitations, what are the limitations? And I just, it was difficult to say exactly 10 centimeters, but you had to come out with some figure. And I decided that if you had more than 10 centimeters of proximal femur, uh, that was probably uh, the limitation. Could it be done? Yes, it can be done. Two meshes, two proximal uh, femoral meshes, encircling the whole femur, um, wired distally, and then impaction bone grafting. Is it worth all that trouble? Oh, golly, I don't think so. Even in a young patient, that's what the x-ray looks like. I mean, your risks of your dislocation are high. You have to use a constrained cup. Is that a good idea for a young patient? Uh, probably not. So in that situation, I'd say just go ahead and fix a um, distal fixation uh, device. And sometimes the femoral canal is simply too narrow. As you see uh, here, this lady was only about um, 33 years old, severe rheumatoid patient, and her sockets, as you can see, have disappeared up to her um, sacroiliac joints. Um, and interestingly, what I, th I thought about this case pretty seriously too. Most surgeons would have gone in and taken the, um, the uh, sockets out from within the uh, pelvis and maybe the stems as well. But I decided that the sockets weren't causing any trouble. She wasn't having trouble urinating. She didn't have retention. Um, so she wasn't getting a large uh, ureter. So I thought I'd do an extended trochanteric osteotomy, take out the femoral components from the uh, uh, normal approach and just leave the sockets behind, which is what I did. Um, anyway, so I used uh, cone conicals in this uh, particular patient, but simply because her canals were just simply too narrow. Incidentally, she, I saw her in the ward about 10 years after these operations and thought, oh my golly, um, she's done something. Anyway, what had actually happened was she um, had um, been knocked over by a motor car and she had bilateral supracondylar femoral fractures and her hips were absolutely, uh, absolutely mm -hmm. fine. Anyway, so there's just a quick run through, um, not too scientific, but just showing you what we do and why we uh, do it. And I hope that's been, uh, been informative and helpful. Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. It's a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Frank Picaluga if he can tell us, tell us uh, how were the first cases of the Italian hospital impaction grafting performed? Hi, Frank. Hi, Martin. Uh, hi, Graham. Hi, John. How are Hello. you? Oh, yeah, I'm very well, thanks. How are you keeping? Nice to see you. Oh, fine. I'm, I'm here at the farm since mid-March because of the quarantine. So, excuse oh, me by the bad. background. <laughs> um, nice to hi, see John. you. Uh, nice to see you too. Thank you both for your time. Uh, I'm the only survivor of uh, the first infection grafting at our hospital. The, the, the truth is the first four or five we made through, we used uh, Ilia Crest tips from the patient. Even though we had a bone bank at our hospital since 1947, uh, we used, I don't know why, because it's, uh, HIV was beginning and hepatitis B and C, the transmission of these uh, diseases. So first cases, uh, Dr. Puzo wasn't very uh, enthusiastic about using the bone bank, but after seeing their results and listening to the patients, uh, they had a lot of pain. The surgery, we had to harvest a lot of ilia press. So we'll be yeah. done using uh, heads from the, with the band, sending heads to the bank. Uh, to the bone bank and then asking them back. Um, how do, did we do? Uh, Dr. Puso was um, an engineer almost. He loved to make uh, arrange things at home. So what he did, he created a set of rods, metallic rods, a big one the size of a tiny stem, and then smaller ones just to impact the bone. Uh, you just try to hit by eyeballing the center of the femur. 
uh, it was difficult. And for cementing, uh, sometimes we use the uh, uh, syringe and um, plastic tube, the ones you use it for femoral pneumothorax. Okay. And some we just used uh, our fingers and we didn't know Suck what happened. Yeah, like us, we sucked it. We sucked it down because uh, there was another choice. You put a, a suction catheter and sucked it in. Yeah. Thank. You. And then afterwards, that was not all. We, we returned to the bone bank. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. There is a question yeah, from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. There is a question from Nicholas Busey, who is working uh, since many years in Cleveland Clinic, and he's uh, uh, enjoying this talk because he works in the States. And I would like to, to share his microphone and, and, and also uh, his camera. Nico, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So thank you very much for, for the introduction. It was a fantastic talk, as always. It's great to learn from you guys that are at Exeter. The question that I had was, in those acetabular reconstructions, especially defects 2A, B, 3As, um, that one of the main like, uh, reported mechanism of failure is the cap actually spanning out, and we always worry about trying to fix, get good fixation at the ischium, at the pubis. Um, do you worry at all when you do this impaction grafting and you, you show that you use the, the augment and you cement the cap um, on having the cap span out? Any, any tips or tricks if you were to to do those cases since you don't get any fixation um, this way? Yeah, because from the, from the very first time I ever did impaction bone grafting of the acetabulum, uh, which must have been the late 1980s, um, every time I did it, I worried because I couldn't believe that it wouldn't spin out. Um, you just, you, you couldn't imagine that by cementing onto something that had no contact with host bone, that it wouldn't just spin out. But don't ask me why. Uh, I think, you know, if we'd used 36 or 40 heads, I'm sure they would have spun out. Uh, the smaller the head you used, probably the safer because of the reduced friction at the uh, interfaces. Um, but they didn't spin out. I mean, but if you, if you took the cup in a pair of forceps and pulled on it, of course you could just pull the cup out. Um, but somehow it, it stayed there. And I used to sweat every time that John wants to say something. Well, I think we did change our technique, Graham. I think, you know, initially the teaching was that you tried to cement it and make sure there was no contact with the host, any part of the host. I mean, certainly now with the trabecular metal, I make sure that the damn well is contact with the trabecular metal and the host all around. And uh, I think part of that is because you get enough macro stability that, that it won't spin out, you know. Um, so I, I think we do get host contact. And uh, uh, I think that was one of the reasons that those those original series didn't do so well with the large rim meshes because we deliberately didn't do that. And the interesting thing of those but was... All cases, sorry, you, all our cases early on, like the, um, the Petruzios, and some of those cases I showed, we know there was no contact. And the Nijmegen group, there definitely was no contact. We may be doing that now, maybe it makes you feel better and, and you're more <clears> comfortable <throat> to get the weight bearing straight away, etc., etc. But in those original cases, there's no doubt we had no contact between uh, host bone and the problems we did have, the ones that came loose, we, we attributed to the fact we were using the small chips. Uh, and that's hardly surprising. The bigger chips you use, the more stability you actually, um, you actually achieve. I just think, you know, Nick, I think, you've got so much, I think you've got so much compression, you know, when you actually really, uh, it's a cement, you would cement as hard as you could, just like in a primary hip replacement. Mm -hmm. And I just, you just, you had so much material inside a confined space that, that the compressive forces gave you that, uh, that stability, certainly until the soft tissues that sort of started healing around and, um, and, and helped reduce uh, the risk. Yeah, but you're quite right, Grant. You know, when you were saying about the me mechanism of failure of those large rim meshes, it wasn't the rim meshes failing. The rim meshes didn't fail. They were always there. It cleaved within the graft. Oh, yeah, and no question. Quite, and one of the things we did, not irregularly, when we saw that the that there was cleavage in the graft and the cup was moving, but the rim mesh was there. I quite often went in, uh, you found there was more bone graft on the floor, leave the mesh on and find enough bone to put trabecular metal in, regraft it and, and make, put it onto a stable position. So I, yes. I think we do need host contact and, I, and certainly I don't do it without host contact anymore. The, the cup as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. But what the what the, the construct of the carbon cement, yeah. Good. There is another question uh, by Dr. Cecilia Pascual Garrido, who as Nicolas is is an ex-resident of our institution. She works in St. Louis, Missouri, and wants to ask you something. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I really want to congratulate you. Those cases were really amazing. Uh, we don't tend to see those type of, you know, bone impact graphs here in the United States. I was wondering if, the, when you do the femoral impacted bone graph technique, I saw your X-ray web with cementation. Have you, you, have you used those with cementless stems? So what have we done with cementless stems? Sorry, that last part, just say it again. Have you used the femoral impacted bone graft technique with a cementless stem? Cecilia, I don't know what a cementless stem is. With no cement. <laughs> I know that. Um, no, we never have. I mean, the only cementless stems I used were very, very occasionally in revision surgery where I went for, for distal fixation, but that was less than a dozen cases in my whole, uh, in my whole career, I can say. Um, now, I'm just thinking there has been a publication, I think, with cementless stems. But, you know, um, the graft is going to heal from host bone inwards. And there's no doubt that you're going to get a fibrous tissue interface between the, the stem and the, and the graft before that graft is incorporated. The fibrous tissue will, will get in from the top and go down around it. That doesn't mean to say it's not going to work. But I would be worried about it with the sort of pumping and pressure effects in the longer in the longer in the longer term. I don't, John. Do you want to make a comment on on that? I, I, yeah. I think well, that's... we did. We do have some histology. Lars Linder looked at it, and he found out that there was osseointegration integration actually of the cement against the new host bone. So I think you can get it osseointegrated. integrated. So it's a different interface, as you're saying, Graham. And also the stability. There was some work done in the laboratory, looking, admittedly, uh, not with the. Uh, um, current designs of uncemented stem, but they looked at the stability of an Exeter type stem in graft with and without cement, and it was five times more stable with cement, as you might expect. Yeah, so I think, think you, you, you're probably really, okay with cementless stems if you have some host bone contact. Yeah. So I think the difference is, and therefore I wouldn't entirely call it impaction bone grafting, because the definition of impaction bone grafting originally was that there was no contact between the stem and the, and the host bone if you've done a proper impaction. So Yes, I think you can Im 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 uh, impact, but the, the cement, the cementless stem would have to have stability in its own uh, in its own right. Yeah. So using it as a filler. Yeah. 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 In order to prevent fracture of the of the uncemented stem, maybe if you get or, good or, fixation or history, just as it works with an uncemented cap, you can use proximally a, a, a bone impaction grafting in order to to prevent those fractures of the, of the stems that are quite frequent. Right. Okay, great. Um, Graham, when I was with you, you told me the idea to impact femurs, primary femurs, in order to use a small stem or a smaller stem. And this question has two reasons. What do you think about this? And what do you think about short stems that are smaller and maybe this could be related to why, to what your original ideas that you told me 20 years ago. Um, so um, I'm just trying to think about the incidence of wanting to use smaller stems. Um, we wanted to use smaller stems in patients over 70, particularly women over 70, because we found that they were the ones who lost bone if you used a large stem in, in those cases. Uh, and, they, and 10 years down the line, they'd become more porotic than in patients who had stems of number two size or smaller. So that was the one reason for wanting to use smaller stems. Now, that may or may not be the right thing to do because there seems to be some evidence available now that you increase the risk of periprosthetic fracture in those elderly patients if you don't use a, uh, if you use a small stem rather than a big, uh, or rather than use a big stem. Now, changing to shorter stems, um, you know, it's very difficult to change if you have such good results with the standard length stem you've got. And if you're hardly ever having to take cement out, um, then you're not having to do difficult revisions, which one of the advantages of a shorter stem, obviously, is that it would be easier to revise to get the cement out. Um, did we need shorter stems because uh, we would preserve bone better? No, we didn't, because the double tapered stems preserve the proximal bone extremely well. And I can show you cases of 40 and 45 years now. We've got at least 
half a dozen cases over 40 years where the proximal femur is only slightly more product than the day you did the uh, operation. Um, but um, we have produced the shorter stems. They're not very short. They're down to 125 rather than 155 um, uh, millimeters. Um, but that was done uh, because of, of demand, patient demand. Uh, also, we had experience with the 115 and 125 millimeter stems that we used in CDH or small uh, canals. So we knew they worked, so we could confidently move to shorter uh, stems. Um, but in Exeter, the chaps have been pretty careful about moving to those shorter stems because the results using the standing stem are, are just so good, it's very difficult to warrant the change. Um, now, the shorter stems have been put through, and John, remind me, what's this, that special study called? Oh, that all Beyond new Compliance. Yeah. Beyond Compliance, um, which keeps very, very close watch on any new design that's been introduced we called the shorter stem a new design or one that needed to go through beyond compliance. And so far, there's no issues with it um, uh, uh, whatsoever. The other reason for that I was talking about it, but never really did it, was that in the young patients, the same reason as the Nyberg group are impaction bone grafting the socket in young patients, is that if you impact a primary, when, that, when and if that stem fails, you will be back to where you started uh, so rather than putting a three or a four in a young patient with only three millimeters or four millimeters of cancellous bone, if you do an impaction bone graft, you've got a centimeter or 1.2 centimeters of, of cancellous bone. And when that hip fails, you, you're still back to the primary situation. So it was something I was thinking about in younger patients, but never really did because we needed the bone for the revisions. Great, thank you. I remember that. Uh, do we have 10, 15 minutes for a case discussion? Yep, yep, sure. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry about the x-rays, but this is a 35 BMI old lady, 72 years old. She was operated of the right TH8 in 2002, and he, she came to us in September 2018 with right hip pain and no signs of infection. The little detail is that she has this total knee process that is close to the, to the hip and the hip, both the stem and the cap and maybe the knee are loose. What would you think? What would you do? You want to go first, John? Yeah, I mean, um, is the knee loose? Um, uh, she, she has no symptoms. Oh. Only this, this, the bone scintigraphy is uptaking that, but she is fine of the knee. Yeah. Well, I would concentrate on the hip, I think, at, at that point. I mean, the stem looks loose. If we could go back to the original. I mean, just looking, making comments on these films before going back on. I mean, the cortices aren't bad around the distal stem here. If you look you know, in zones uh, three and five, the cortex is quite good. Mm. And beyond that, I think it was still reasonable on the next film. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, and I think it was also good on the lateral. So I'm not so worried about the quality of the bone of putting in a normal length stem, uh, to be honest. So I, I think I would, uh, um, firmly, I'd obviously template is, but femoral impaction grafting would be a very good option, I think, for that femur. Um, that, yeah, if you're talking about the femur, you, that distal cement will be quite difficult to get out. So I'd definitely use Oscar uh, to make enough space there. And then you could actually use it as a plug for your guide wire, possibly. I'd use an x-ray control. Um, and perhaps leave a little bit of that to screw the guide wire into, but then I'll do a femoral impaction uh, on top of that. Thank you, Graham. Do you know, do you know how long that stem is, um, Martin? I think it's an astonics uh, cemented stem, but I don't know the, the length. But I mean, it, it's quite important as to well, what stem you're going to use. Um, and if it's the same stem as an extra, then you really haven't got a problem. You could do exactly what John has uh, described, but even here, I think you could almost leave that cement there and so the quarters is on too bad um, and put in a shorter, uh, a shorter, a shorter stem and not uh, reduce the distance between the tip of the stem and the knee replacement uh, at all. And if the if you were worried about the quarters, you could always just strap a strut graft on there or something just to protect you until everything, uh, everything heals. You mean you'd impaction graft with a shorter stem, Graham? I would impaction graft with a short stem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, Good. well, certainly that's an option if 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 it's uh, if there isn't space. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. it was but what if, I, if it, I did. If a standard it standard length exit, it's no problem. I, it was a good election because if not, we would have to bypass this plug and put the uncemented distal fix, fix uh, that is, was going to, to stop here and there will be a stress concentration here and a high, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, a high percentage of, of, of periprosthetic fracture. That's so great. this was... Wrong, wrong sort of implant, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this was my... Uh, this was uh, the, the impaction rafting that I did in 2018. So this is two years ago. Also, oh, this is now, and mm -hmm. it's a two-year follow-up. And good. okay, let me show you the one that I did in 2019 because I did one in 18, one in 19, and one this week without knowing that you were coming here. This is the case. Sorry, it's a video. I took it from my, from my Instagram, but it's a case of 66, 67 year old girl with an infection with eight, eight years of uh, a spacer with a meticillin resistant Staph aureus. We changed the spacer. We divided the spacer in two pieces. And then we had this defect. So I think this is not a contraindication uh, not the 10 centimeter that you mentioned, sorry. Uh, and we made the, this technique that we, that I learned from you. And I think it's maybe, it's not a, it's not a, um, a limitation of the technique. Maybe it's a limitation of the implant, but not every, because not every, every implant uh, can be successful with this technique, as you know. This is the, the post-operative x-ray, and this is the one-year follow-up. I use a trabecular metal cap with a wedge, also with impaction grafting, and I was happy to see this, that the bone arrived to the distal part of the femur. So it was a, a good, indication for me in this patient. What's your opinion? How active is the patient, Martin? Uh, the patient is six, 60, 69 now. Uh, she walks and she has no comorbidities. And she's walking with a, with a cane, of course. She has a high uh, discrepancy of leg length. Uh, due to the eight years of the dislocated, highly dislocated spacer. So that was the, the bad thing that we, we, we could not uh, equalize leg length. Right. Well, that's not surprising. Um, Martin, I would strongly encourage her to use a cane. I would strongly encourage her to use crutches if she's happy to use crutches. Um, otherwise, uh, well, I, that component is probably going to break anyway. Um, Do you think uh, the stem can break? Yeah. 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 You may be lucky. It may take 10 years. Um, but if she yeah. lives for more than that, um, I mean, the stainless steel these days is really, really strong. But the, the, uh, I mean, it depends how many muscles she's got attached to it as well. She probably hasn't got a lot of muscles. So maybe the forces through her hip are nothing like somebody, you know, who's got a trochanter there and everything. So you might be lucky. But um, did you have a choice to do anything else? Well, you could have put a distal fixation. No, maybe in the susception that you showed us, but she had a, a huge infection, and I don't, I didn't want to put a structural yeah. big allograft inside her femur. And I would have just made a you had no choice to do but to do this, but there is a risk of her stem fracturing one day. Yeah, but presumably yeah. you could put antibiotics in the graft that you used. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We we use yeah. vancomycin in the graft. Yeah, and, and tobramycin in the in the in the cement. I think that's a big advantage of the technique that it's a it, the graft is a carrier for some, for antibiotic, isn't it? I mean, it is a, a absolutely. A, yeah. The only thing about I would say about these, you know, I think this is a good option for this lady. The only thing I would say about these circumferential meshes is we don't really have good histology for what's happening in those, and as you know, the histology varies between osseointegration and complete incorporation to areas where the it's just a dead 
um, dead bone graft in an inert fibrous stroma. So I don't know what's going on in these meshes, but the truth is they do seem to last a long time, uh, some of them. Well, Mike McHale did those five bi biopsies. Um, I have, I have published biopsies of this in the BJJ. Right. Yeah, yeah. Was, it, was it completely within the long mesh? Yeah, circumferential yeah. meshes, yeah. Right. And, and Mike pu published those ones in the medial femoral neck, John, five cases, didn't he? Uh, where he found um, the bone healing under, directly under yeah, the mesh. Yeah, I was just more concerned by the, you know, the long circumferential, because you worry about the stability, you know, the length of the, of the femur that's actually circumferentially grafted. Because um, th those were just small calcar meshes that Mike did. No, 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 no. Big, no, no, big you, meshes. Mike. No, 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 Mike McCoy. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, well, I'm, that's, that's right. Really you did publish that. So perhaps I'm being unduly pessimistic. But, but in any case, we know that they last a long time. And it, yeah. it serves the thing here. It's given uh, antibiotics there. And it's a good option, I think, Martin. Well done. Thank you. And we also did some uh, studies in cow bones with circumferential meshes and they were uh, tested in, in special machines and they supported big amounts of newtons in, in, those, uh, uh, in those reconstructed experimental uh, bones. So this is the case that I operated this week. The patient was operated a long time ago with this Charlie stem that I heard many times John telling, this is the typical channeling failure when I was in Exeter. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in a video. And the surgeon who works in, in another city um, put this uncemented distal fixation. He had an intraoperative periprosthetic fracture. He put a lot of bone graft in the medial part. And this is one of the most frequent mistakes in impaction bone grafting of the acetabulum. He used, uh, he used a um, trabecular metal cap, which is not in contact with the bone, with the host bone. So this, also, this is also uh, a mistake. Uh, then he put, after the periprosthetic fracture, then he put a plate. He was not happy. The stem sank like two or three centimeters. He thought that with another plate, he could uh, fix this and he couldn't so he took the plate out and the patient got a uh, pseudomonas resistant to imipenem which uh -huh. is a quite um, uh, powerful antibiotic so he wrote me a letter or an email and he says please martin try to preserve the bone allograft of the cap as well as the trabecular metal. Could you please do that? Of course, I said no. And we treated him in two stages. What we found in October was that the femoral canal was 30 millimeter um, uh, width, width. This was the distal part of the femur. This was the proximal part that was absolutely lost. So in October last year, we put this big spacer, 30 centimeter. The patient cultured uh, this pseudomonas that was resistant to many um, antibiotics, but not to cefepim and meropenem. So he was treated like that. We were supposed to, to do the reimplantation in April, but the lockdown started. So this was postponed until this week. So we had this patient with eight months of spacer. What would you do? Big, big canal, 30 millimeter wide. You think the infection is gone now, Martin? The CRP is good. gone. The skin is good. The infectologist allowed us to perform reimplantation. The laboratory is fine. And we don't do aspirations, but the other things were were good to reimplantation for reimplantation. So, well, Martin, even the well-known orthopedic surgeons in the or hip surgeons in the states, like um, uh, Proposky and stuff, would say um, do an impaction bone grafting. Um, you really have very little choice here. I mean, you you know, you can't put a thirty millimeter unsmented stem down. We just know they get terrible thigh pain. Anything bigger than a 
uh, 18 or bigger. Um, and there are just, no, I think there are no there are no 30 millimeter wide stamps. No. Well, then yeah, <laughs> definitely got a choice. <laughs> yeah, but I think most people would, um, if they're going to do that, they would they would excise that proximal bone and. Um, but but I mean, fix it to what? Well, well, they'd have cement, wouldn't they? But it'd be very yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, with your skill, Martin, I think I can predict what you're going to do. You're going to reconstruct the proximal femur because there's a lot of good, really good grade trochanter, put a mesh on, and do a long stem impaction grafting. You know, we don't have any more meshes in Argentina, and that's a big pity. Oh. Uh, that's the problem. We don't have meshes. Oh, really? I ask, I ask for a mega prosthesis, a tumor prosthesis, and I took the powder out of my impaction grafting instruments. So I operated last, last uh, Monday. I didn't know that you were coming. And here you can see the biggest um, reamer. It's dancing inside the femur. What is questionable is this, um, Mega prosthesis, you can cement it or not. The cemented version, the widest, was 11 millimeters or 12 millimeters. That was the widest version of this stem to cement. And, and the widest uncemented was 22. So, what, what would you have done with this case? Intraoperative, you have a tumor prosthesis that the widest is 22, uncemented, and the other option is to cement a 12 millimeter mega prosthesis. Well, I guess what you did, you cemented the uncemented stem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did that. That's the, the trial. I made impaction grafting with the trial that was fortunately polished. And I got rotational stability. And this is after packing. We did a 3D custom made for the acetabulum, which is one third of the cost of the trabecular metal cap nowadays in Argentina. We are producing this in our country. It uses trabecular titanium, and you have to take a CT and they, they made the cap taking in, in, into account with their defect. So in these complex cases, we always cement a dual mobility cap. We don't do DMs for primary surgeries, but only for these complex cases. And this was the initial x-ray. So mm. what would you think that this uncemented titanium porous coated stem uh, would work with cement and with bone grafting. Yeah, it may well as do. Long as you, yeah, as long as you've impacted really well, which I'm sure you have, then I think there's a very good chance of it working. Yeah. I mean, in, at Rush in um, Chicago, they did use uh, mat stem devices and impaction grafting and published quite good results, didn't they, Graham? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think it'll be all right fixation-wise. Tell me, what was the top end of the femur like? Was it intact? Was the trochanter attached to some bone at the top there? This, this part? Yeah. Yeah, I had to cut it because it was a huge trochanter. Uh, at the end of the surgery, I had to go anterior and deperiostize everything because it was a huge um, uh, trochanter. So I cut it in some slices and put it um, just to give some stability. But it was there's like no a, There's no continuity with the distal femur? No, 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 no continuity, no. no. So you, you've wired it on, was there anything on the top end of that implant that it can heal to? Was there a... Yeah, uh, it's not poroscoded at, at that oh, part. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, well, looks good. So far. Less than one week. 100% mm -hmm. <laughs> success. Okay, the question is, can this 
big reconstructions predictable in the long term. And I would like to end with this and show some cases. This is a 52-year-old girl that we operated many years ago. Uh, I think it was in 2005. Uh, we thought that she had an infection, but on the second stage, we, um, we arrived to the conclusion that the fistula was caused by a, 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 a swab that she had, uh, supraacetabula. So she never cultured anything, and we did this big mesh and also distal strut allograft. And you can see her, of course, she, she has some trendlembo gait, but she's 14 years old post -op operation and, and still working. So okay. I don't think that this might fight, might fail, sorry, after 10 years, Graham. This is another case we operated also many years ago. Typical Charlie failure would say, John. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a massive destruction of the proximal femur, B3, B3 uh, periprosthetic fracture. Well, the technique that you developed, not the stem that you developed, but the technique with a copy of the instruments that they are no longer available in Argentina. So we only have the option of, of, uh, of Striker and I think uh, Sima, which is more or less similar. Well, this is a cementation. And of course, this patient has no trochanter. It was lost in in previous surgeries, we use a long stem by passing at least two, cortica, two cortices of the femur, the distal part. We use a gap ring, which was not the best implant uh, to use in revision surgery. We had a 34% failure rate uh, after two years. And this is the 14 year follow up. The patient came to us with this protrusion. It was the start of the lockdown, but I operated her one month ago, and she's now walking. This is a video from yesterday. I use a trabecular metal cap. So I, watching these cases, I also believe that this uh, can be a predictable method to the years. And this is the last one, a patient at 69 who presented us with an enterococcus, uh, very aggressive uh, germ. We use uh, a spacer, big spacer, and the same type of reconstruction. And this was one of the first cases that I performed. And this is the 17 year follow up of this patient, which is not so good taking care of all comorbidities. We also use a copy of the uh, recommended stem, but at least we can put an exit stem on the other side. <laughs> so good. some considerations, and we finish with this. After 20 years, last week I turned on to 50, and it's been 20 years of doing revision surgeries. I think that impaction bone grafting of the femur continues to be a very useful tool. I also think that a hip surgeon must know how to perform this method. And the only way to do it well is by learning and continuous training. So I consider that it should be included in the cadaveric labs. But for example, you think, would a hip surgeon do a PAO without training? And this is the same situation. It is so far the only reconstructive technique that restores bone stock. Although it was originally conceived for the acetabulum, I think it surpassed the effectiveness in the femur due to the migration problems in the caps. So our indications nowadays are endoclinic type four defects and young patients with loss of bone stock. It gave me, gave me by far more satisfaction than distal and cemented fixation. I think it is more an, an art than a method or a technique. 
I also realized that not all cemented polished stems are designed for this method, but after more than 10 years of continued use, I did not see too many cases with the biological effect that Wagner described after years of distal fixation. But I consider this is a simpler, reproductible, and successful, but more expensive method. So impaction grafting and distal and cemented fixation should not be antagonic procedures. There just be two reconstructive methods in revision surgery, like cemented and uncemented in primary surgery. So, although our unit is named Sir John Charlie, it has many things that were learned from you guys. So if God comes to earth and tells us that we have to choose one stem for all our patients for the rest of our life, for sure, we would choose an exit stem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank Martin, you I think I'll have to change my uh, contraindications and say you can use how much, however much of the proximal theme is missing, you can still use impaction bone grafting, having seen your x rays. Please, please <laughs> say that. <laughs> Martin, those were uh, amazing cases with those uh, large meshes. I mean, really extraordinary. So well done for that. Tell me, why, why can't you get the meshes anymore? Because clearly you, you love this technique and it has advantages. What, uh, because the striker distributor doesn't bring them here anymore. And the local producer is not producing it any, many, any, anymore. Uh, maybe the reason is that we use one or two cases a year. Right. That would be the main reason. And you can't and, import it for those cases. No. And last week, the distributor of Striker asked me, uh, would you like to uh, have some meshes here in Argentina? Because they are going to take down from the market. So is that true? Meshes? Uh, they, they haven't made that decision, I don't believe. But there's a problem with the, um, uh, these, the uh, what they call those standards bodies that have to give a license that they now need so much evidence that there is discussion about that. So we're making a very strong case that that should not be the case for the, all the reasons we've discussed this afternoon. So I don't believe they have made that, um, but I know that they probably warn the markets to stock up just in case there's a, a supply problem. But uh, we, I've just penned the letter that Graham and I and all the rest of the people here are signing uh, to Torbian, giving our surgeons support that they should continue with these things because it's so important for patients uh, to, to be able to continue with this technique, as you have so well described. Um, Martin, it's, it's a very strange thing, but if a number of cases per year goes down below a certain level, the regulatory authority is saying, therefore, this is no longer required or indicated. They don't say, well, you know, oh, it's really indicated in these cases and you can't do anything else. It's just that you're not using enough of these and therefore we're going to stop it. So unfortunately, well, it's not a striker issue, but we are now, as John says, uh, but John, we were kind of told in a roundabout way, look, if you still want these, you better buy a whole lot because we're going to stop um, uh, making them. Um, mm -hmm. And as John's, we put this letter together, which John has, which we're going to submit um, the evidence of why we still require them. So hopefully they will, will keep going. But again, it's not really in our hands or strikers. The, the problem being, it depends how much striker is prepared to fight to keep them. And of course, from their point of view, financially it's not a great thing so therefore is it worth them spending more money on it and i actually told them straight out a few weeks ago i said listen um you know you do so well out of the exeter that in fact it's worth taking a loss on some things to make sure that people can carry on using the exeter and all the methods that it should be able to be used good point i didn't know that part of the story so Thank you very much, guys, for finishing. I am really happy to see you, Graham, that although you may support the South African rugby team, you look like a New Zealand All Black with this black coat. So I am really happy to see you so well. And so for John, it's been a great pleasure. And thanks a lot for coming with us. Thank you for inviting us. Been it's a pleasure. Thanks. And Thank regards you. to you and Frank, also to you too. Really nice to hear from you again and see that you're still all fit and well. Best Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Thank you. Have Take a great care. weekend. Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye Frank. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot for staying. Thank you. Ciao, Martin. Ciao, ciao.
Buen fin de muchas gracias. Chao, chao. Igualmente a ustedes. Thank you so much.